heard and come and be a part of that time tonight. We've had a lot of people donate candy and we're appreciative of that. But what we need is we need people to come and be out there. It does no good to have candy if you don't have trunks and people to pass that candy out. So it's not too late. If you want to just throw something together, put a couple of pumpkins in your trunk. We don't care. Just come, put a smile on your face, give out candy, and let kids know that we love them and that Jesus loves them. It's such an easy way. And, and let's bring a little more candy, too. Okay, uh, and a little more candy. I know candy. that Walmart's been picked over clean, so we just bring, bring a little more candy. That'd be great. So we want you to come and be a part of the festivities tonight and help us to love on our community in Jesus' name. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we are especially grateful to have you in worship with us this morning. And we want to ask everybody to remove their Connect card. And uh, on one side of that, you can let us know you were here with your name. If you're a guest with us, we'd love at least an email address that we can send you a message and say thank you for worshiping with us. And on the other side of that are some sign-up opportunities. Not only do we have a trunk or treat tonight, but we've got the drive through Nativity coming up. And that's another one where it's great to have help with parking and with set work and decorating. We need all of that. But again, you can have all the beautiful sets and all the great costumes and all the wonderful animals. But if there aren't people in those costumes, in those sets, it's not a drive through nativity, is it? Uh, we don't want it to be a drive through zoo. It's not a safari. We need people. Uh, and listen, when you see acting on there... Don't let that scare you. You don't have to have any acting chops. You don't have to recite any lines. You literally just kind of stand there and go through some motions and walk back and forth. It is so easy. Anybody can do it. So, but we need people to do it. So I want to please ask you to prayerfully consider being a part of our drive through Nativity because it literally cannot happen without actors. It cannot happen without prayer. Uh, so you can sign up to pray. You can sign up to do both. It's not mutually exclusive. You can pray and act. Uh, and also, we do need some firewood and some sand. If that is something you can help with, firewood and sand, we could use some help with that. And uh, you can just see me, see Paige, see Matt, let one of us know, hey, I've got firewood, I can bring firewood. Or, hey, I've got sand, I can bring sand. That's for the little fires that we have all over the place. So uh, you can help us out with that as well. Young at Heart is next week, so uh, if you're going to come be at Young at Heart, you need to sign up for that. Uh, we are going to have our budget presentation on November the 14th. We're going to do dinner again, but uh, instead of having a potluck, we're going to have uh, it prepared ahead of time, like we do on Wednesday night supper. But we want people to come and to enjoy the food and fellowship before we hear the budget presentation. But we want to know how many people to plan on, so you can mark that there. It, it's at no cost to you, so it's a free dinner, so come enjoy that. Uh, and then we do have our Wednesday night supper menu on there as well, and hope to see you at Wednesday night supper. Uh, in your order of worship, you see lots of other things to remember, to think about. It's a very busy time in the life of our church, but it's such a rewarding time. It's such a blessing to be able to serve the Lord and share the love of Christ with our neighbors and the nations. Let's go to him together in prayer. Father, thank you for this time of year. Thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you are so good to us as we are coming into November, a month where we specifically think about Thanksgiving. Uh, Lord, may we truly be thankful of all of the blessings you get, you've given us, and may we look for ways to further those blessings onto other people. And sometimes that's through our praying, sometimes that's through our giving, uh, either financially or with backpacks or Christmas boxes or candy, uh, and sometimes it's through our time and our presence. And God, I pray that you would guide us, lead us, and bless us in such a way that we truly can be a blessing to this community. We love you. We thank you. We pray that all of our worship today would bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
wonderful, wonderful. This is, this is a Sunday where we, we think and talk about things that the world finds very somber. Our All Saints Remembrance, we're talking about the trial of Jesus Christ. But Jesus won. All right, on the very end of all of this, we know how it turns out. Jesus wins, and because Jesus wins, this message has gone from generation to generation. We can teach our kids and our grandkids the truth and the hope and the love that Jesus has for us, and we can celebrate that. So this day is not a, a sad day for us, as serious as it is. This is a day of victory and joy, and so we celebrate that. I would invite all of us, if you would, let's stand together. Because of Jesus, when that role is one day called, we will be there, everyone. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will be there. psalmist says that precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. And that can be a peculiar verse for us because from our perspective, death is a parting and is a time of sorrow. Uh, but from the heavenly perspective, uh, death is just an interruption. And it is an interruption in God's good creation, but it's one that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave to rectify. And someday, as Paul says, death will lose its sting. Its power has been defeated. Uh, and we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, we also try to look on the death of the Lord's saints from a heavenly perspective. And we can consider it precious because we know these people are with Jesus. And they have left behind for us an example, a testimony, a witness that we should follow and add to that great cloud of witnesses ourselves by the way we live our lives. And so our chairman of Deacons, Tommy Phelps, is going to be reading to us the list of names of those saints, those members of our First Baptist family who have gone ahead of us this past year to the glorious reunion in heaven. And we pray for their family and their friends, even as we look forward to that great day when Christ returns and there's no more sorrow and there's no more separation. Tommy. Mrs. Catherine Maxwell. 
Mrs. Margaret Thompson, Mr. Ralph Starling, Mrs. K. Howard, Mrs. Susan Cranford, Mrs. Jean Grant, Miss Rachel Jordan, Mrs. K. Mobley, Mrs. Billy Thomas, Miss April Cartledge, Mr. Alan Inglet, Mr. Will Smith, Mrs. K. Anderson, and Mrs. Angela Canistra. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the life of each of these that have been named. Dear Lord, we thank you for their influence upon our lives and upon your kingdom. Dear Lord, as we remember each of these, we just thank you for their impact upon our lives, their impact upon your kingdom. Dear Lord, we just pray that you would use us to bring others to know you so that when our days come to an end, that we will know that those individuals are joining us or we will be with those individuals in heaven one day. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the way that you love us and the way that you care for us and never let us lose sight of that love. In Jesus' name, amen. And we know that this year you've had other people in your life beyond just First Baptist Church members who've gone on to be with the Lord. So I'd ask that you take a moment and in your heart think about the people that are not with you today. But I want you to do that thinking about the impact that they left on you. And then I want you to think about what do you need to be passing on to the people in your life. This is a history spanning thing, Christianity. The word of God, the message of Jesus Christ. It doesn't and cannot stop with us. People have invested in you. What do you need to do to invest in, in those around you? Maybe your kids or your grandkids, nieces and nephews, neighbors. Because as we think about our destination on the far side of Jordan, Tommy said, we, we don't want to be the only ones that we can think of that are there. We want there to be such a great cloud, one that would make, that would bring honor to those who've gone on this year. So that's the seriousness of today, but at the same time, it's still a day of victory because we do have a home on the far side of Jordan. Friends, let's stand. Let's stand and let's sing this song together.
standing as Jay and Kelly read God's word for us. Our Old Testament reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 1 through 4. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Our New Testament reading is John 14, 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I invite all of you to have a seat as Jay leads us in a time of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this beautiful world that you've given us. But even more so, the fact that you've prepared a place for us, that we will go eventually. As Tommy read the names of those that that have passed on ahead of us, I think about all those that had such a huge impact on making who I am today. And I just thank you, uh, thank you for them. Thank you for the uh, lives that they lived, the many lessons that they taught, taught, um, but also the fact that they shared your gospel with those around them. And I just thank you so much for that. The place that you prepared for us is going to be a wonderful place. Um, and I just thank you that we know that, uh, that you're there waiting on us and that uh, one day we will all see you face to face. Dear Lord, I just pray that you will just be with us today. Help us hear what you have to say for us. Pray that you will be able to take what is said and, and what you have to say in our hearts that we will be able to take it and apply it to our lives. Pray that you will just be with those that aren't here today and, and uh, as we go out our lives that you will just help us to share your gospel and your message with all those that are around us. There's so many people that are hurting, that are sick, and, and we can provide comfort for them, dear Lord. And I just thank you that you will give us and know that you will give us opportunities to do that. Pray that you will just bless us in all that we do. Help us serve you in, all that we, in, in everything that we do. And as always, I just thank you for allowing us to live in the land of the free and the home of the braves. Amen. <laughs> You're welcome. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> Back down we go. One thing that I do want you all to notice is we sing one more song to prepare our hearts for a very, very a, a tough message is that there's the progress. And we talked about this last week. There may, they, there may be sorrow for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And joy comes in our morning as well. Amen. <laughs> Verse to verse to verse, we progress.
stand together. has a message for them, and I've got a microphone for Ben. All right, guys, I got my mic. My, my mind was a little foggy this morning for some reason, Matt. All right, come on down, guys. Over here, over here, we got plenty of seats, plenty of seats. Good to see everybody. If everybody can sit down here on the carpet, that'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you all. Thank you. Good to see you all. All right, your song was wonderful this morning. So, guys that were, guys, girls that were singing, very good job. And uh, it reminded me of something. Your song to love him in the morning, love him in the noon, uh, in, the, uh, in the afternoon, love him when the sun goes down, and serve him. Okay, and you, and we should do that all the time. Now, I want to ask an honest question though. Have you ever felt? Like somebody was ignoring you? Raise your hand if you've ever felt that way. Somebody was ignoring you. Or maybe somebody even acted like they didn't know you for whatever reason. You know, sometimes it's usually somebody wants something else and, and they want it and maybe they don't want to share it and they just kind of run off on the playground somewhere else and you're like, what's going on? Well, guess what? That sort of thing, and, and kind of even worse, happened to Jesus. And that's what we were uh, focusing in on today. Everybody look up here. 
Uh, Jesus had a really good friend named Peter. That's just one example. And Peter wasn't the only one. But guess what? Peter was going to stay by Jesus' side. He even told him that, I will stay by your side. You know, even, you know, if we have to fight, I'm going to stay and protect you. And then the sun went down. <laughs> and I was thinking about your song, Love Him When the Sun Went Down. And guess what? The sun went down. Shh, let's listen. Let's listen. And the sun went down. And Peter, Jesus was arrested. And Peter was kind of watching from a distance where he could see. He was watching from a distance. And then, uh, but people noticed Peter. And they said, you know what, Peter, I think he was with this guy, Jesus. Were you with him? You kind of even sound like you're from the same area. And, and that's what he said. He said, I don't know who he is. And it happened three times. And Jesus told him it would happen. And Peter said, I would never do that. I would never deny you say I don't know you. And it happened. And the whole story about that is sometimes we do that too. Well, how do we do that? Sometimes if we feel like, oh, I don't need to pray today. I don't really feel like reading my Bible in Sunday school with my teacher today. Sometimes even the way we treat people. When we need to treat people like Jesus wants us to treat them, and we're not, when we decide not to do that, that's even kind of turning our backs against Jesus because we know how he wants us to treat people. So when we do those things, that's kind of saying the same thing that Peter did. I don't know who Jesus is. I'm not even going to act like Jesus right now. And sometimes we're guilty of that. So what do we do? It goes back to your song. We serve people. We serve him in the morning, in the noon, and when the sun goes down. We love him in the morning, noon, and when the sun goes down. Okay, and that's what we have to do. Your song explained it really well, what we have to do. So I thank you for your song this morning. Let's pray. God, we all know that we fall short, that we mess up. Lord, that we ignore you sometimes. You, you are a good friend to us always. And God, sometimes we are not a good friend back. And God, so we confess that. We are sorry for that. And help us more to love you each day, every part of the day, when we wake up, all throughout the day, even when the sun goes down, whether we're at home or at school, or, or meeting someone on the playground, a new friend. Lord, let us greet them and show them the kindness and love of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I hope to see you tonight at Trunk or Treat, 4 to 6. It'll be back here at the park. Hope to see you and your family. Invite someone, okay? On the third level, children are now invited for Children's Church. Twos and threes will be in the nursery area, and K4 through first will be in the chapel. All right, if you'll please take your Bibles and open to Mark chapter 14. We are nearing the end of Mark's gospel and our time together there. Last week we saw Jesus forsaken in the garden as he was abandoned by his closest friends. You know, as we talked about last week, they couldn't even stay awake and watch and pray with him, even for an hour. And then Judas came, one of the twelve, and betrayed Jesus with a kiss, with a sign of friendship. And Jesus was arrested, the disciples fled, and he was taken away in the dead of night. But not only was Jesus forsaken, we're going to see in today's passage of Scripture, he was also condemned. He was rejected. In the dead of the night, Jesus was secretly tried by the Sanhedrin. Their goal to gather evidence against Jesus they could take to Pilate, the Roman governor of Palestine, and present because they wanted Jesus killed. They wanted him dead. And in between these two trials, we're going to see what Ben was talking about, about Peter's denial of his Lord. And as we read these accounts... What we're going to discover, and in particular, as I, and of course, this is one of those stories that you know, I've read thousands of times, and I'm sure you've read it so many, many times. That, but this time as I was reading it, I kind of began to think to myself, wait just a minute, who's on trial here? Is Jesus on trial? Or is Jesus the righteous judge who is examining the hearts of those who are seeking to condemn him and deny him? Maybe it's Peter. 
that's on trial. Maybe it's Pilate, maybe it's the religious leaders who are really the ones on trial. And as Jesus exposes their guilt as the righteous judge, he forces us to look into our own hearts and examine ourselves because we're also on trial. So I think we'll see that as we look at this passage together. And we begin by looking at how the religious leaders were the ones really on trial. And Jesus was their judge. Look with me at chapter 14, verse 53. They led Jesus away to the high priest. And all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes assembled. I mean, it's, it's the whole team, right? The whole gang has come together. And Peter followed him at a distance right into the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the servants, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. but They couldn't find any. For many were giving false testimony against him, and the testimonies didn't agree. Some stood and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. Yet their testimony didn't even agree on this. Then the high priest stood up before them all and questioned Jesus. Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest questioned him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They all condemned him as deserving death. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, Prophesy! The temple servants also took him and slapped him. We've we've repeatedly seen the religious leaders of the Jews and, and how they were so consumed with preserving their religious tradition and their doctrines because those were really the sources of their power and their position and their prestige. This was everything to them. And Jesus understood this about them long before the religious leaders arrested him. You remember the parable of the vineyard owner Jesus told back in Mark chapter 12 where uh, the vineyard owner was sending some messengers to check on his vineyard and the workers there were abusing them and kicking them out and then eventually started to kill them. And he said, well, I'll send my son. Certainly they won't mistreat my son, but even the vineyard owner's son they killed. Well, the Sanhedrin is fulfilling the prophecy of that parable. They are actually doing that right now. The very Son of God is standing before them And they kill the son of God, the the, the planter and owner of the vineyard of Israel. So we see there in Mark 14, 53 through 65, this, this trial of Jesus, but really it's the religious leaders who are on trial. And notice in verse 55 it says, The whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could not find any. So think about that. Does that sound like justice to you? Does that sound like people who are really interested in uncovering the truth? Or does that sound a little bit like a conviction in search of a crime? I mean, they start with the death penalty. They start with the the, the sentence. That's what they want. They want Jesus to be dead because they're jealous of Jesus. They're afraid of Jesus. And so he must be guilty of what they can't agree. Can't agree what he's guilty of, but he's got to be guilty of something because they want him dead. Dead, And so now they're looking for evidence so they can drum up a charge so they can have Jesus killed. Talk about a perversion and inversion of justice. They're putting the cart before the horse. And they don't even realize that they themselves are on trial and they are giving evidence of their own guilt. Right there they are proving themselves guilty of rejecting Jesus for tradition their guilt. They were rejecting Jesus, the Son of God, for the sake of their religious tradition and the power that it affords them. They proved they weren't really seeking the things of God. They weren't concerned with His will or His kingdom. This was all about their own little kingdom. 
building and protecting their own little kingdom. And in so doing, they reject God himself and erect an idol in his place, the idol of religiousness. The idol of their own self-righteousness. Because that gets them what they want. It's no wonder Jesus repeatedly calls these people a brood of vipers, wolves in sheep's clothing, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. They are the perfect example of what we heard in our Old Testament reading in Jeremiah 23, about how the leaders of Israel were failing the people. They were supposed to be the under-shepherds of God's flock, but instead they were destroying and scattering the very sheep God put them in charge of. And that's exactly what the Sanhedrin were doing. Little did they know that in this trial, they are actually sealing their own fate. In a few decades, in 70 AD, Rome will come as an instrument of God's judgment. He will destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and scatter the people of Israel throughout the world. They rejected the truth. They literally sought to kill the one who was truth. Notice how often in Mark's account he talks about their false testimonies. How they couldn't even agree on their... They couldn't get their story straight. They couldn't even get two people to agree on what they were supposedly witnesses to. And, and this becomes so agitating to the high priest. He becomes so irritated that he finally just stands up and says, Enough! And he starts to question Jesus himself. They cared more for their way than God's ways. They were more interested in preserving their narrative than actually knowing the truth. And they'd become so inwardly focused that they had completely ignored the very mission that God had given them, the very reason the people of Israel existed. You remember when God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, they like that part about them being blessed and about their enemies being cursed. But that part about blessing others and blessing the world, that just... That kind of started to fall by the wayside. And so as the priests and the Sanhedrin stand here condemning Jesus, he didn't want there to be any question about what they were doing. You remember throughout Jesus' ministry, especially Mark's gospel points out this, this idea that Jesus was kind of keeping everything a secret, right? He would heal somebody, he'd say, don't tell anybody I did that. Somebody would start to say he's the Messiah, he would say, let's just kind of keep that under wraps for now. Even demons that he was casting out would try to say, we know who you are, son of God, and he would silence them. But no more. His time has come. The moment has arrived. There's to be no more secrecy, no more parables. When the chief priest pressed Jesus asking, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? He answered unequivocally and clearly, I am. I am. Now that alone would be enough to convict Jesus of blasphemy. But Jesus didn't stop right there. He kept going. He had determined their guilt. The trial was over. And now Jesus, the righteous judge, is about to give his determination. He's about to pronounce his judgment. He goes on to say, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. That's a quote from Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament about the day of the Lord. What Jesus is saying is that the one that they are accusing and condemned, Jesus is the righteous judge who will sit at the right hand of God Almighty and at the end of time will come down with the clouds of heaven to judge all of humanity, including the Jewish leaders. He is the righteous judge. Now let's not get on our high horses as we read this, lest we stand accused alongside of them, because as Ben talked about in his children's sermon, we can also be guilty of rejecting Jesus. We can be guilty of keeping Jesus at arm's length because we don't want him to interfere with what we think is a good thing. You know, it's like, it's like we think we've got this good thing going for us, and Jesus just kind of sort of stirs the pot. He agitates things. 
And we don't want to put our cushy job at risk or our comfortable way of life. That pet sin that we don't really want to give up. Those political opinions that we don't want challenged. The party lifestyle on the weekends that we think we just can't do without. I mean, we have a reputation, right? We have an image to uphold. We don't want people to think we're Jesus freaks. Jesus is fine on Sunday mornings. He's fine in times of crises. But we don't want him messing up our day-to-day lives. So we keep him at arm's length. Is that your attitude toward Jesus? Is that how you live your life? And listen, we can be guilty as the Pharisees and Sadducees were of rejecting God's truth in favor of our traditions. You know, oftentimes church folk, we can elevate our church programs and our traditions to the place of idolatry. Well, we've never done it that way before. Or, we've always done it this way. Can be the mantra of a church that places their programs and their property over the very people that they are called to reach. It's like we want to enjoy all of the blessing without passing it along to other people. We want to keep it to ourselves. And just like Israel, we fail to remember our mission, the reason that we're here. Maybe we've got the tendency to try to preserve the good old days of how we grew up in church. And listen, I sympathize with that. I grew up in church. I was going to church nine months before I was born. We were there every time the doors were open. I mean, it, it, it all Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I mean, I have such fond memories of running around the church playing hide and seek when my mom was in choir practice, you know. I mean, that's how I grew up. And I've got such fond memories myself in my little church there in East Tennessee of how we did worship and the songs that we sang and the traditions that we had. I understand that desire, that nostalgia. But when we try to preserve the past, You know, the traditions, the programs and events, the the musical preferences. When we do that, we've got to be careful that we don't begin to idolize the past. And and we, we, we get so hung up with holding on to what was yesterday that we fail to reach the people today. The people that need Jesus right now. Not in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s or the 60s or the 50s. We need to reach the people of the 2020s. How do we do that? What breaks your heart? What gets under your skin? What drives you to prayer? Is it the broken, hurt, and lost condition of our neighbors and the nations? Or is it our opinions and preferences and and comforts? The Sanhedrin chose to reject the truth because they really, they worshipped their tradition more than they worshipped God. They wanted to keep their comfortable way of life. and So they rejected the very commission of, that God had given them to be a nation through whom all the world would be blessed. In fact, they chose to curse the blessed one. He's standing in front of them, and they curse him. Now, Paul has a totally different idea. In Romans 9.3, Paul wrote, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. That's amazing. On the one hand, you've got people that would rather be blessed if it meant everybody else would be cursed. But here's Paul saying he would rather be cursed if it meant that his fellow Jews could be blessed enough to know Jesus. Which are we? To which of those extremes do we tend to lean? Are we more concerned with preserving our blessings and enjoying the good things that we have? Or are we willing to to be cursed by others? Are we willing to lose things? Are we willing to suffer and to sacrifice to reach the lost? Have you ever been so burdened over a lost family member, a friend, a classmate, a co-worker, that you you were just so burdened with the thought that they were going to spend eternity in hell that you said, Jesus, I don't care what happens to me. I'm willing to be cursed if it means they can come to know you as Lord and Savior. We're on trial. We're on trial about where our priorities are. We're on trial about whether we are more interested in the truth of God's word or over our traditions and the way things have always been. Will we be found guilty? 
The second person on trial we see is Peter. Peter's on trial. Now Mark has already told us that Peter had followed at a great distance. He comes into the courtyard of the high priest. He's warming himself by the fire along with uh, all of their, the priest's servants. And all of this is happening while Jesus is being tried and spit upon and beaten and abused. Now let's remember who Peter was. Peter was the spokesperson, right? He was, he was the, the natural leader of the twelve. And Peter wasn't shy about stating his opinion or about asking questions of something he didn't understand or even pushing back at Jesus on something he didn't agree about. He was bold and brash, which often meant Peter leapt before he looked and and often had his foot in his mouth. But Peter also had faith. He had faith enough to step outside of the boat onto a storm-tossed sea and walk to Jesus. He had enough faith to declare that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And remember last week, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was willing to pull out his sword and attack one of the temple guards. Peter was willing to fight and kill for Jesus, but he wasn't willing to stand and die for Jesus. Now, to be fair, Jesus didn't want Peter nor any of the disciples to stand and fight and die for him right then and there. That's not what Jesus wanted. And I'm sure that even though it broke his heart in the moment, Jesus didn't want to see any of them arrested or killed that night. I mean, think about if that had happened. If Peter or the other disciples had been arrested or killed, the church would have died before it even was born. So I, I believe that for the sake of the kingdom, it was good that they didn't resist, but they ran and they hid. But listen, as they did that, they weren't thinking strategically like that. They weren't thinking big picture like that. No, they were scared. They ran for their lives. It was every man for himself, including Peter. Now let's look at Mark 14, beginning of verse 66. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's maid servants, so this young lady comes to him, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And then he went out to the entryway. So he's going to get out of here. So he goes out to the entryway, and a rooster crowed. When the maidservant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, You certainly are one of them since you're also a Galilean. And other Gospels tell us it's because of his accent that he sounded like a Galilean. Most people know that I'm not from around here, for example, right? You're a Tennessean, aren't you? That's right. My accent gives me away. And it was giving Peter away. And then he started to curse and swear, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. While Jesus was on trial with the Sanhedrin, Peter was on trial too. He was on trial with those in the courtyard. And when the rooster crowed that second time, Peter realized that he was guilty of rejecting Jesus for personal safety. He was willing to reject Jesus to save his own skin. I mean, Peter was eager to identify with the one he declared to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God, a military hero, someone who was going to come in and become king and set up God's rule and reign and overthrow Rome. Peter liked that image. But a suffering Jesus? A rejected Jesus? He wasn't so sure about that. Three times Peter denied his Lord, and Luke tells us that three times Jesus heard it. Jesus was aware of each of these. Luke tells us that after that third denial, when the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him, and he went outside and wept bitterly. Can you imagine that? You know, we don't mind being like the Peter who swings swords. Zealous for the things of God, filled with righteous indignation at evil and injustice. We kind of like that, but we don't like to admit how often we're like the Peter who denies Jesus. When we feel the pressure to conform to the ways of the world, when we realize that our beliefs aren't the popular approved beliefs, 
I mean, like Peter, we can gather on Sundays and sing the praises of the Messiah, the Son of God. He feeds our empty bellies. He cures our diseases. He calms the storms in our lives. We want to stand at His side and be counted as, as His followers then, but when it comes to being misunderstood, mocked, ridiculed, when it comes to being left out and persecuted, when we have to make sacrifices or suffer for the cause of Christ, well, that may be a different story. In those times, we follow the Lord, but at a distance. We, we love Jesus. We want to follow Jesus, just not too close. I mean, it's easy when we're together on Sunday mornings to stand up, stand up for Jesus. But what about Monday morning? Wednesday morning? Friday night? How do we do then? And just as Jesus looked at Peter, when we fail our Lord, when we deny Him, He looks at us too. Can you imagine that look? It wasn't a look of condemnation. It wasn't a look of anger. It was a look of compassion. It was a look of sorrow. It was the look of a broken heart. Have you denied Jesus? On what occasions do you find yourself challenged with the temptation to kind of downplay the fact that you're a Christian? Maybe you thought, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm holier than thou. I don't want to be left out of the business deals that happen, you know, at the bar when we're away on a business trip. I don't want to feel strange when I'm at that party with my friends on the weekend. I don't want to make things awkward, so I'm just going to go along and get along. I'll just go along with everyone else. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to make a big deal of it. I mean, after all, it's just this one time. I mean, God knows my heart. Yes. Yes, God does know your heart. Do you know your heart? When will we stop warming ourselves by the fires of the world? And stand up for Jesus Christ, regardless of the outcome. Think of the love and the trust and the boldness it took for Jesus to die for us. When will we have that same kind of love, trust, and boldness to live for Him? Listen, it's not going to get any easier in this world. It's going to get harder. Grandparents, it's harder on your children than it was on you. Moms and dads... It's going to be harder on your kids and on your grandkids than it's been on you. It's going to get harder. Will we stand up for the Lord? Jesus was on trial for being the Messiah. Peter was on trial for being one of Jesus' followers. And listen, you know, Peter, he wasn't, he wasn't like the religious leaders. At least Peter struggled. At least Peter was willing to follow Jesus behind enemy lines, right? I mean, Peter was taking a risk that night. Remember, he just cut off the ear of a temple guard. And he went right into the courtyard of the high priest. I mean, that took some courage. Now, obviously, Peter's no soldier. I mean, I, mean, I think he was aiming for the guy's neck, and he, he got his ear. Peter, Peter was no soldier, so if he can't even take out one guard, how could Peter ever rescue the Lord? I mean, he's not going to make a, a, a jailbreak that night. So maybe Peter was trying to help Jesus the best way he knew how. He was, he was trying to be present for Jesus. Let's give Peter a little bit of, of the benefit of the doubt here. But when the moment of truth came, Peter made the choice to save himself. I mean, there's no doubt Peter possessed a tremendous selfless love for Jesus. I think that's why he didn't run away the first time he was questioned. Or the second time he was questioned. I empathize with Peter. You know, I empathize, I empathize with his struggle. He tried to deny himself and follow Jesus, but in the end, he denied Jesus and he ran to save himself. How often are we like that? Who among us hasn't struggled between denying ourselves and denying our Savior? It's real. And the rooster's crowing, you know, it had a dual, a dual purpose. It was both a sign of judgment, it was calling what Peter did a sin. It was letting him know that what he had done was a complete failure. But it was also a mercy. Because it awoke Peter to the fact, 
that he had denied Jesus and it allowed him to grieve over what he had done and in sorrow repent of his sin. It was a sign of judgment, but it was also a mercy. And so Peter didn't strike or spit on Jesus. He didn't join in the chance to crucify him. Rather, he ran out into his own private darkness and he broke down and he wept bitterly in confession and sorrow and repentance. It was the beginning of Peter's turn from self-preservation to self-sacrifice, from seeking to be blessed to being willing to be cursed for the cause of Christ and to be a blessing to others. It was a moment of transformation for Peter. And it's a word of good news to us because, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're all guilty of being like Peter. We're all guilty of denying Jesus in some way or another. We're all guilty of trying to keep him at an arm's length, wanting to follow Jesus from a distance. But there's hope. There's good news. Because Peter was restored to Jesus. Peter became the leader of the church. Remember in John, after his resurrection, Jesus came to Peter and reconciled with him and reaffirmed his call. There's hope for us. We don't have to stand convicted and condemned. We can confess our sins and turn to Jesus in sorrow and say, Jesus, forgive me for denying you. Help me to live for you. There's a third person on trial here, and that's Pilate. Let's look at chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. As soon as it was morning, having held a meeting with the elders, scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin, the chief priests tied Jesus up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You say so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate questioned him again, Aren't you going to answer? Look how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still did not answer, and so Pilate was amazed. At the festival, meaning the the Passover festival, Pilate used to release for the people a prisoner whom they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. And Pilate answered them, okay, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that they would release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate asked them again, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? And again they shouted, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and after having flogged Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Did you notice how the religious leaders changed the charge when they brought Jesus to Pilate? Remember, they found Jesus guilty of blasphemy because he called himself the Son of God. But when they bring him to Pilate, they understood that religious blasphemy really wasn't worthy of Rome's attention. Pilate wasn't going to execute somebody because they committed blasphemy against the Jewish religion. But the charge of sedition, that would get the attention of a Roman governor. So they changed the charge from blasphemy for saying he was the son of God to treason. He's saying he's the king of the Jews. Well, that was different. The last thing Pilate needed was a religious zealot leading a revolt against the empire. But after interrogating Jesus, Pilate wasn't convinced. When he asked Jesus if he were the king of the Jews, Jesus' answer was a little ambiguous. Remember how clearly he said, I am, to the Sanhedrin. But when Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews, he says, eh, if you say so. <laughs> eh, that, that's what you say. It's very obvious that Pilate and Jesus had different definitions of what it meant to be king of the Jews. And so when it seemed like sedition wasn't going to get the job done, the Pharisees and Sadducees just started hurling accusations at Jesus, just hoping that something would stick. And that's when Pilate knew that envy was the real reason the chief priests wanted Jesus dead. Pilate decided Jesus wasn't a threat to Rome. This was not worthy of his time or attention, and he was ready to release Jesus. Now listen, this was Jesus' chance. This was Jesus' one opportunity to get out of this situation, and Jesus stayed silent. That amazed Pilate. Didn't this man understand what was happening? 
Did he want to die? Why didn't he defend himself? But Jesus wouldn't answer. It's almost like Pilate showed Jesus the escape hatch. All right, Jesus, here's your way out. And Jesus closed it and stood silent and resolute, waiting for what was about to come. Pilate was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He, he believed in Roman jurisprudence. He believed in justice. He didn't want to unjustly condemn an innocent man to death, but Pilate couldn't stand the members of the Sanhedrin either, and he didn't need a riot on his hands. In fact, we know from historical records that Pilate was already on shaky ground here. He had mismanaged the Jewish people before, oftentimes leading into some bloody riots, and Caesar wasn't happy about that. So he wanted to keep Caesar happy. And so we see that though Jesus was on trial before Pilate, once again, really it was Pilate who was on trial. He was on trial before the crowd. He was on trial before Caesar. He was on trial before Christ. And Pilate's cowardice revealed his guilt, condemning Jesus for political gain. The Sanhedrin condemned, rejected Jesus for tradition. Peter for safety. Pilate for politics. And Pilate thought he was clever by giving the crowd the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, who was a real threat, who was a real, honestly dangerous man, but he didn't understand this was always the choice that humanity has had to make. Will we choose the one who heals or the one who harms? Will we choose life or will we choose death? Will we choose the ways of God? Or will we choose the ways of man? That's always been the choice before us. And Pilate chose the path of least political resistance. He rejected truth in favor of personal power and protection. John has an interesting exchange in his account of this. It says in John 18 that Pilate asked Jesus, You are a king then? And Jesus replied, You say that I'm a king. But Jesus goes on to say, I was born for this, and I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked, what is truth? Pilate couldn't recognize truth standing right in front of him. But neither could the Sanhedrin and the priests. Neither could the crowd. Neither could Peter. Every one of them rejected truth. The religious leaders made up their own evidence. They drummed up charges. They rejected truth so they could condemn truth. Peter, he, he lied in fear, in self-preservation. He denied that he ever knew Jesus. He rejected truth. And Pilate knew the truth, that Jesus was innocent, yet to save his political career, he rejected truth and condemned Jesus to die. Listen, we're also on trial, you and I, every single day. We're on trial in the eyes of God. Every day God is examining our hearts and minds, our motives and actions, our words, every day. Jeremiah 17, says, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. We stand every day under God's watchful eye. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He sees every bit of us, the good, bad, and the ugly. But the world is also judging us. We're on trial before the world. They're watching us. They're examining us. They're looking to see if we really believe what we say we believe. They're looking to see if Jesus really does make a difference in our lives. Listen to what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 4. He tells us to act wisely toward outsiders and make the most of the time. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you should answer each person. Paul understood. The world is watching us. They're listening to what we have to say. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, that we should therefore let our light shine before others, so they may see our good works and give glory to to our Father in heaven. How will we stand up to the scrutiny? Are we willing to let God search our minds, try our thoughts, see if there's any wicked way within us and lead us in the way of righteousness? Are we willing to do that? 
Maybe right now you're being convicted of a sin in your life. Something right now the Spirit is convicting you of. One of those pet sins you don't want to give up. Something maybe nobody knows about. Maybe it's a bad attitude. Maybe it's a bad habit. Maybe it's an anger issue. Maybe it's a decision that you've been reluctant to make that you know is the right thing to do, but you won't do it. God is our righteous judge. And listen to me. You can either submit to His judgment now, a judgment that will purify you, a judgment that will bring His grace and mercy to bear in your life and transform you from the inside out to be who you were meant to be, or you can resist Him now and stand before Him at the end of time and be judged when it's too late to make a change. And you'll suffer the consequences for eternity. God is your judge. You will stand before His judgment either acquitted because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He took your guilt and shame upon Himself. He said, Father, I will suffer the punishment they deserve. You can either face God now and experience that grace and mercy or you can resist it and face Him at the end of time. When there's nothing more to be said but depart from me, I never knew you. Which is it for you? I implore you, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you've never come to Him and said, God, I am guilty, I know I'm a sinner, I stand condemned before you already, Jesus, I pray you would forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come and live inside of me and help me to be the person that you want me to be. If you've never done that, I invite you to come right now and settle it today. You can know that you will stand before Him innocent and righteous because of what Jesus did, or you can spend your life always wondering what will happen to you after you die. Which will it be? And if you're already a believer, maybe God is laying something else on your heart. Maybe God is leading you to unite with this church family. Maybe God is calling you to surrender to Him in some form of service to His kingdom. Maybe there's something in your life you still need to settle with God and, and, and give over to Him that you've been hanging on to. Whatever the Spirit is leading you to today, You can either deny Him, reject Him, or you can come today in submission and obedience. What will you do? Would you stand and pray with me? Father, truly as we read this story of what Jesus endured and suffered that night that He was betrayed, it it shocks us, it breaks our heart to think of what the righteous Lamb of God endured and experienced so unjustly that night. But God... It's because of our sin. It's because of us that He endured that. And we truly are the ones on trial. Father, You are examining us even right now. You know our hearts. You know our motives. You know our thoughts and attitudes. You know every horrible thing we've said and done. And apart from Christ, we stand before You condemned, guilty sinners deserving of eternal damnation. But You are a God of grace and mercy and love. And you made the way through Jesus that we could be made right with you. That our sins could be atoned and paid for. That we could be made pure and righteous in your eyes. Not through anything we could ever do, but through what Jesus himself has already done. And if there's anybody here that needs to do that today and experience that transformation, I pray they would come right now. And Father, if you're speaking to us about any other decision we need to make, may we be obedient, may we be trusting in you. And not walk out of this place rejecting what you've said to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
the instrumentalist to play through that verse one more time. I'm about you to bow your head and close your eyes. Uh, you know, it, it, I know that none of us in this room are perfect, including me. And I just sometimes feel like that we sometimes resist the Spirit of God. And we sit and we listen to a message and maybe we take a little bit of it in. We find some of it interesting. Some of it maybe we kind of don't pay attention to and let our mind wander. But if God has said anything to you, if any scripture, any point of this has jumped out at you, if you felt any bit of conviction to walk out of this place and not to have dealt with God with it, is to do yourself a disservice. I just want to invite you to pray right now. And whatever God maybe is speaking to you, to rededicate your life, to turn over an area of your life to Him, to ask God to forgive you for not being the witness you need to be, for not being bold at work or with a certain group of friends or family, do that right now and pray and ask God to help you to not be like Peter, but to stand boldly and truthfully for Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for the ways in which we conform to the ways of the world. And we try to blend in and to look like those around us. And when we do that, we are spitting in the face of Christ, denying that we ever knew you. Lord, I pray that you would send some roosters to crow in our lives to give us the warning when we're doing that. Because this world desperately needs believers who will stand boldly and clearly for your truth. May that begin with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 The Dent family, come up here. We've got John and Shelley and Corbin Dent. And they are coming on promise of letter from a sister Baptist church here in our community. And of course, Corbin has been uh, coming and, and worshiping with us for quite some time and serving and involved. And her parents have come, and we rejoice with that. And what we prayed together up here a minute ago is that we would be the church for them to help them to grow and thrive in their walk with Christ, to stand alongside them through the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, but also that God would help them to find that place of service, that, that this would be a church that allows them to use their gifts as members of the body of Christ. And if you rejoice in that, if that's your prayer as well, will you say amen? Amen. 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 We are so glad to have you all. God bless you, and it always enriches us when God brings new believers in to, to add their unique talents and gifts, what we call your shape, to add that to uh, this body of Christ to help us to be all God would have us to be. We rejoice in that. And they're going to be standing with me out front, so as you go, I hope you'll stop by and say hello to them and encourage them. We also have boxes uh, up at the front as you go out that allows us to give, to be a part of what God is doing here through events like Trunk or Treat, but also around the world as we further the cause of Christ. So, Matt, let's go out with a song, and I hope to see you all tonight in the park and see you back next Sunday. Let's sing this together. Trials come on every hand.